you. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, thanks to all the members of Maywood Rotary and also the, uh, those who are here from the, the clerk's office. You know, last month during our Lunch and Learn series, we had a view from the bench and we touched so many advancements made in the Illinois Supreme Court with Chief Justice Ann Burke and learned many of the roles and responsibility of the Cook County Circuit Court from the Chief Judge Timothy Evans. This month's series is going to focus on state government and, we, and we're calling it uh, Let's Talk State Government. And it's going to include top elected officials at the state level and offer us a peek behind the curtain in Springfield. You know, it's crucial that voters stay involved and active in their local county and state government, even when there's not an election around the corner. And one of the best ways to do that is to educate yourself on the various positions at the state level and their very many duties. I am especially happy to introduce uh, our next speaker, Illinois Comptroller, Susanna A. Mendoza, who will give us a better role of the Comptroller's office and, and the, the party plays in state government as well as in our day-to-day -day lives. Comptroller Mendoza took office December 5th, 2016, serving the last two years of her friend and mine, the late Comptroller Judy Barr Topenka. She was reelected in 2018. She's also the very first Hispanic independently elected to statewide office in Illinois. Since becoming Comptroller, she has absolutely transformed this office, shifting the priority to the funding of nursing homes, hospice centers, schools, and the state's most vulnerable citizens during and since the state's two-year budget impasse. Comptroller Mendoza has initiated a transparency revolution in state government, working with legislators of both parties to introduce and pass transformative legislation to make financial information more publicly available than ever before. These measures include Debt Transparency Act, the Truth in Hiring Act, the Budget for Debt Act, and the Vendor Payment Program Transparency Act. Whoa, Susanna, oh my goodness. Prior to her statewide election, she was the first woman elected, Hispanic woman elected as the city no, wait, second woman? Second woman. First woman. First elected woman, okay. Yeah. Elected city, Chicago city clerk. She championed a huge technology overhaul, shifting more than 1.3 million Chicago city vehicle Ooh. sticker customers from an inefficient and archaic seasonal sales program to a round the year sales. The program was awarded in 2015, a Bright Idea Award from Harvard University. Now, before she served as city clerk, she served six terms between 2001 and 2011 in the Illinois House of Representatives. She started as the youngest member of the 92nd Illinois General Assembly, and she was routinely recognized for her leadership in the areas of social service, education, law enforcement, job creation, and animal welfare. And I know her well because we got elected at the very same time. And so I watched Susanna. She was like an energizer bunny all over the place getting things done for people in the state of Illinois. She currently lives in Portage Park neighborhood with her husband, David, and her son, David, and her mom. Susanna. <laughs> Life happens, huh? It sure does. I mean, I feel like I'm 85 after that intro. Like, wow, I, I'm tired. I did all that. You did all that and you did more. I only touched the a thumbnail sketch of, of the, the work that you've done. And you've been someone to look to for answers. I mean, you look for, you're a real problem solver and we're lucky to have you in the comptroller's office. I'm not gonna steal your thunder because I just read something very recently about something else that hasn't happened in state government in over 20 years. So 
You go, Susie. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Clerk Karen Yarbrough, my friend Karen. I appreciate the very warm introduction. And thank you, Mr. President and everyone who's in attendance today for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, yeah, that was an earful. Uh, hopefully you were all able to keep up. But I feel like, uh, you know, when you get these amazing opportunities to serve the public, uh, you don't want to lose a minute, right? You don't want to waste a minute. You just got to get to work and get stuff done. And there's nothing I like more than a big, fat, delicious plate of problems that I get to sink my teeth into and hopefully wipe that plate clean, right? That's the goal. So I'm super delighted to have an opportunity to share, you know, my perspective as controller about Illinois' fiscal health and also why I believe there is good reason, really good reason to be optimistic about the state's future. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before... I get into all those uh, details. I do want to, on a personal side, take a few minutes to talk to everyone about the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and to share a very personal story about what my family has been through. Some of you may know this, some of you may not, but I, I think it's an important story to tell um, so that people can understand um, how big of a deal this pandemic really is if it hasn't touched you personally yet, how lucky and blessed you are. Uh, but my oldest brother, Joaquin, who's been my best friend since... I have recollection, is a Chicago police detective sergeant. And for as long as I can remember, he has worked the third shift in some of the city's toughest neighborhoods. But despite his best efforts to stay safe during the pandemic, uh, Joaquin became critically ill from COVID in the fall. Uh, by mid-November, he was hospitalized with the virus, actually two days uh, after his 56th birthday. He was admitted to the ICU uh, and he struggled with life-threatening complications, including a series of mini strokes in his brain and total uh, kidney failure. To be completely honest with you, there were times when we weren't sure he was even going to survive. That's truly how bad it was. My brother was hospitalized a total of 41 days at Northwestern and then he spent a little over a month in an inpatient rehab center. Um, and thankfully, he pulled through, but after he was discharged, he came to live with me and my family so that we could help take care of him. So I know, Karen, we said that I live in Portage Park with my husband, uh, our son, who's eight years old and just started third grade, and with my 80, now 86-year-old uh, mom, but add to that my brother, Joaquin, who's now moved in with us so we could we could help take care of him. I mean, that, that puts us all together, and, and clearly, it's a lot to deal with. But we pulled together and we've made our way through all of it. And I'm happy to report that he's doing better. I wouldn't say he's doing great, but he's doing better. Um, it'll never be what it was before. You know, right now, as a matter of fact, he's at dialysis, which he'll need to do three days a week for the rest of his life. Um, but I, I share the story because I just think it's really important that, you know, you hear people talk about long COVID and maybe people think that's not a big deal. But in this case, like long COVID, these are the stories that I think people need to hear more of that, you know, a relatively healthy person, he did have diabetes, but it was under control. Um, but for all intents and purposes, 56 years old, a cop who hadn't had a day off in 22 uh, days, um, clearly uh, was pretty healthy, uh, comes down with this disease, and it almost killed him and his life will never be the same. So I can tell you that I never thought in my wildest imagination that I'd be saying that the easiest part of my life over the last past nine months has been managing billions of dollars in state debt. But you know, I've got that. I feel so confident about that. You don't need to worry about a thing. Uh, but I share the personal story because I think it's really important that people understand the gravity of what we're going through right now as a country and a world, frankly, and it really just can't be said enough. There are families all over Chicago uh, and Illinois who have experienced something similar to what my family is going through and frankly, much worse. COVID-19, it has killed more than 26,000 Illinoisans and it's obviously called, caused um, you know, untold emotional and economic anxiety for, for millions. And the costs, let's talk about that as the controller, right? I mean, my brother thankfully has good insurance, but I've seen some of the bills for his care. And a whole lot of people, you know, are out there who will suffer the long-term effects of COVID won't have insurance. And that's one of the great unknown numbers about how much COVID will continue to cost the state of Illinois in the future. And the same story you'd be hearing from fiscal officers in the rest of the country. 
And although restrictions were loose in the summer and we've been able to enjoy, finally, it feels like getting out and seeing some friends, you know, it's important to remember that we're nowhere near in the clear yet. So I'm asking you, this is my final plea here, to please urge your friends and loved ones, the people in your businesses and social networks, to get vaccinated as soon as possible if they aren't already. Feel free to share my brother's story. He's perfectly okay and understands that I do it all the time because if it'll make one person who's hesitant change their mind, then it's worth it. Uh, because vaccinations, you know, they shouldn't be political. They, they save lives. They jumpstart the economy. And vaccinations and face coverings, while aren't fun for anyone, you know, they're the very steps that we can take to protect ourselves and others. And they're the only way that we can hope to wipe out this virus and get back to some semblance of normal living. All right, so enough about that. Today, I wanna to talk to you about the state's finances and remind you why you should never, ever, ever bet against Illinois. Let me take you back four years ago now to 2017. We were grappling with the fallout of a two year budget impasse. Services to a million of the state's most vulnerable children and adults were slashed because there was no budget. That's when the state's backlog of unpaid bills reached $16.7 billion with a B, the highest it had ever been in Illinois history. Small businesses, healthcare facilities, social service providers, they were considering layoffs or shutting their doors entirely because of the lack of payments. The state was on the hook for potentially billions of dollars in late payment interest penalties for those overdue bills. Illinois' credit rating was downgraded a record eight times to almost junk status before I took office. And that happened in one of the biggest bull markets ever. It is honestly difficult to be that bad to get eight credit downgrades in a row in a matter of two years. Now, while other states were taking advantage of this and sacking away money in their rainy day funds, we were being continuously downgraded. Now, meanwhile, Illinois was last in the nation in funding of public K through 12 schools, and our investments in higher education had receded. With so much uncertainty facing colleges and universities, students and their parents, well, they looked to out-of-state schools for an education. It was heartbreaking. Things were bleak, indeed. And that's where we were then. So let me tell you where we are today. Much better story. I'm proud to say that since taking office in December of 2016, I've successfully, as your controller, navigated the state through the two worst fiscal crises in our history. The state's two-year budget impasse, which I just spoke about, and now the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, as the architect of Illinois' financial turnaround, in just four years, I've slashed the once mountainous $16.7 billion backlog by nearly 80%, 80%. And we did it without using a penny of federal stimulus funds. And we led our state to its first credit upgrades in over 20 years. That's what Karen was referring to. And this is such huge news because let me repeat that. Number one, we did not use a penny of federal stimulus money to get there, but I can't tell you how big of a deal it is to get two of the three credit rating agencies upgrading our credit in the middle of a global pandemic. And when we talk about how fast we're paying our bills now because our bill backlog is essentially gone, you know, we haven't been this current in paying our bills on time since before the tragedy of September 11th, 2001, 20 years ago. Now, if you told anyone four years ago that we'd have the backlog down to within a 30-day payment cycle by mid-2021, they would have said you were crazy. That's how bad things were. Today, we're paying our vendors as soon as state agencies send the vouchers to me. No more months-long delays in payments. We've slashed the late payment interest penalties that taxpayers were on the hook for. And earlier this year, as I already alluded to, you know, for the first time in over 20 years, We've seen credit upgrades, which of course uh, go ahead and improve our state's bond ratings and are going to help us save millions and millions and millions over time, billions of dollars in, um, by having better credit. This is such great news coming from Moody's, S&P Global Ratings and Fitch Group, the big three rating agencies. 
Moody's and S&P already raised the state's rating, while Fitch jumped its outlook on Illinois' creditworthiness from negative to positive. So it went from negative, it skipped over stable, and went to positive. That's great news. Uh, the improvements we made to the state's bill backlog were key to the upgrades. Analysts noted that. And again, let's celebrate. You know, we, we want to keep our eye on the ball. We still have a lot of more important things to keep doing, keep moving in the right direction when it comes to stabilizing our finances and improving them. But I think it's worthwhile to take a little bit of a victory lap here and celebrate the amazing forward progress. So let's do that. Don't let anybody tell you not to. Now we'll keep going with good news because I love good news. Now the state has increased its investments in K through 12 and higher education. Recently released census numbers show that the state's population loss wasn't nearly as dire as we were bracing for. And the COVID-19 pandemic, it did not cripple the Illinois economy as so many people feared it would. In fact, Illinois is, as you've now heard, moving in the right direction again. And we'll continue to see more gains once the majority of people get vaccinated and we can put the pandemic in the rear view mirror where it belongs. I believe there are a lot of positive changes happening and a lot of reasons to be hopeful about the state's future. And if you think about it from this perspective, if we can see all of this positive movement happening in one of the darkest chapters of our world's history with a global pandemic, you know, in full force, imagine what we can do when we're not going through a challenge like that. Now, you might be wondering, how did we turn things around, especially if I told you that we haven't used federal stimulus money to pay down our bill backlog. So let's talk about that once enormous bill backlog. I inherited the mess when I became your controller in December 2016, and I committed to cleaning it up, and I also committed to getting us those credit upgrades, which we so desperately needed. Now this morning, the bill backlog stands right at about $4 billion. This puts us well within a 30-day payment cycle. In fact, after today's cycle, our oldest voucher date for vendor payments, in other words, our oldest bill in hand, is August 23rd, which means most vendors all over the state are being paid within 10 days at most of their vouchers landing at the controller's office. Now, there was a time when it took almost two years for vendors to be paid because the state did not have a budget. And I lived through that because that's exactly what I walked into in December of 2016. You know, when I took office, nursing homes and hospice care providers hadn't been paid in more than six months. Think about that. The most vulnerable people in our state were put at the back of the line by the prior administration. I mean, not only was that morally unsound, but it was bad fiscal policy. It cost Illinois taxpayers over $1 billion in late payment interest penalties. Now, it might seem like I'm spending a lot of time talking about the bill backlog, but trust me when I tell you, paying it down to the extent that we have is a big deal. It's so huge. And I'm not shy about reminding people how far we've come since those dark days of the budget impasse and what it took to get here. And without years of diligent ma uh, daily management of the state's cash flow by my office, we wouldn't be in such good shape today. To get here, we did utilize financial tools like issuing a $6 billion uh, bond in 2017, which allowed us to refinance from an outrageous 12% interest that we were paying on the majority of these bills down to a 3.5% interest rate. And while I've said that state borrowing should be a last resort, in this case, it saved taxpayers between four and $6 billion in late payment interest penalties for which they would otherwise have been on the hook. It was a great deal for taxpayers. And we also, and this is key, leveraged every single dollar that we could on bills that give us federal matching dollars. So for example, the latest round of borrowing this last December from the Federal Reserve, $2 billion. It was at below market rates for us. So it made fiscal sense to do it. And by targeting medical bills that gave us a federal match of 56 cents on the dollar, we turned that $2 billion into $3.5 billion, stretching the value of the dollar to its maximum potential. In other words, I, I'm gonna pay a medical bill that gives me a federal match for every $1 I spend. The federal government gave us 56 cents. We're stretching that dollar to its maximum potential. And whenever I've had better than expected revenues come into the state over the last few years, 
I've targeted them towards paying down the bill backlog. That's the fiscally responsible approach. It's what we do every day. But it's important for everyone to remember that even though we've brought down the backlog, the state still owes a little less than $2 billion in short-term borrowing. And of that, uh, $928 million lingers from interfund borrowing during the budget impasse, and $1 billion is owed to the Federal Reserve from needed borrowing during the pandemic. Now, as I noted already, Illinois has not been unscathed by the pandemic. To date, we have spent about $4.7 billion in federal COVID funds on emergency COVID-related spending. That's been from everything from uh, N95 masks and cleaning supplies to things like reimbursements for medical staffing and first responders. Economically, we, of course, braced for the worst last year as we watched um, businesses close, right, when the stay-at-home orders were issued. Tourism, travel, restaurants, bars, hotels, small businesses, and big box retailers. Everything shuttered as we waited for the pandemic to run its course. Not only did none of us know at the time that the pandemic would last well over a year, but we had no idea what the economic consequences would be. But amazingly, the fallout, what could have been for the state of Illinois, hasn't been as bad as we feared. First, the federal government has done the right thing by providing assistance to states through the Federal CARES Act and the American Recovery Plan. Illinois initially received about $3.5 billion in CARES money last spring, which has helped cover immediate pandemic-related costs. And by the way, if you want to know exactly how we spent it, just go to my website. It's IllinoisComptroller.gov, and there is a super obnoxious, bright yellow COVID-19 link at the top of the page. You can't miss it, I promise. But the cool thing is, is that newspapers across the country, including Pittsburgh, Tampa, and Seattle, have recognized us as having the most transparent COVID-19 spending portal in the entire country. I am so super proud of that. Illinois is number one. <laughs> you should be, Susie. Yeah, I mean, we don't usually get the like we're number one, but I know yeah. we're number one in this person, so. So listen, listen, um, I know you can go on forever here, but sure. I want to get to some of our questions here. Okay. That, that uh, people, Jim Gleffy is looking for, Oh, could you put have someone, uh, one of your staff to put a, um, he's looking for a contact in your office that we can reach out to, so you can have somebody do this. Um, our president wants to know, how do you fend off pressure from mm -hmm. legislators to overspend and please their political supporters? Where do you find your strongest and best consistent supporter? Well, one thing, um, Bob, she's a former legislator, so she knows those characters. Go ahead, Susie. Uh, you just nailed it, right? I mean... <laughs> Karen, you can say the same, right? When you're worrying about policies in your area and you're talking about money, is that we know that it's very tempting to, you hear that you're, you're getting all these dollars coming to Illinois and you can almost like envision the legislature's yep. already thinking of ways to spend it. Am I right? Yep. Totally right. Yep. And it's just a reality. And maybe if I hadn't spent 11 years as a legislator and with Karen there at the same time, we might be naive to that fact, but it doesn't make them bad. It just make some legislators, right? So that's their job is to figure out how to, you know, how to allocate funds and stuff. So I was very, very vocal. The minute we heard that it was, there was even a possibility, not that it was coming, but that there was a possibility that we would be receiving billions of dollars in federal stimulus funds. Um, I did not wait. You know, I got out right in front of it. I started saying, this is not Christmas. You know, um, you know, Christmas comes every year. Yeah. A federal stimulus package is not going to be coming every year. Uh, we're not like in a situation where we're going to have a open the door on Christmas Day and see a beautiful Lexus with the ribbon on it like you do on the TV commercials, right? We're lucky if we don't get our pickup truck repossessed, right? So this is how I have to think as controller when managing billions in debt is we don't have the, the luxury of looking at whether it's $5 billion or $8 billion coming from the federal government as a, a, like mom and dad didn't send us a check for our birthday, right? Like this is money that we have to be very, very prudent and fiscally responsible when it comes to determining how it's going to be spent. We still have significant debts that are owed to the federal government. So the first thing I said was that uh, we were gonna spend this money on paying back the federal debts that we had taken out, which were about 4.2 billion, but uh, that was the goal. And that's what we were saying. And it made all the news and everybody was like, I drilled it into people's heads. 
But then the federal government threw us a loop, a curveball, if you want to think about it that way, and said that we're not allowed to use federal stimulus money to pay back the federal government, which, you know, in theory makes no sense. No sense. But, no. but it, of course, made my job a little bit more complicated as controller, but we're still figuring it out and we're still just use, utilizing other tools to be able to pay the federal government and then hopefully get that debt off our books a year early and save about $100 million in, in what would have been interest payments owed to the federal government. So, you know, every day, if, if like, you know, you get a as they say, a lemon thrown at you, make lemonade, right? You have to figure it out. But I would say that it's important to be very vocal in the role as controller as to how we should be spending money and not get over eager on wanting to figure out about spending, but actually managing, right? And there is a difference. We have to acknowledge that we have significant debts. Uh, it is not responsible to not pay back our debts in a timely manner. And, um, and also, we need to be as responsible as possible, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because the credit rating agencies are watching it. Right, they are. And if you go back to the ways of the past where, you know, governors and people, the legislature too, who didn't really know much about, like, and you can, I think you'll support me here, Karen. You know, unless if you were a budgeteer, the majority of the legislature uh -huh. has no idea what's going on no, with the no, budget no. workings no. until they have to vote on a budget. But, um, you know, now I'm very much on the inside of seeing how all that goes. And that's why it's even more important to be vocal about how important it is to be fiscally disciplined, which is a hard thing to do, but it's really critically important to maintaining positive and forward movement when it comes to improving our credit rating, which to me is number one. Uh, Armanda Killingham wants to know, has the state of Illinois ever filed for bankruptcy? No, we're not allowed to file for bankruptcy. Okay, there you yeah. go. Yeah. Um, Mr. Lipka wants to know, what's the status of the state pension funds? They are dramatically underfunded. So that's oh. always a question that pops up. Um, and uh, and there's you know lots of arguments as to whether those pension funds should be reworked, uh, the constitutional amendment and you know blah, blah, blah. But I would say that that's been tried and the courts have been very clear that you cannot impair or diminish uh, workers' pensions. And as a matter of fact, I will be bold enough to say, and some people agree and others will disagree, that we should not be trying to pass legislation that diminishes workers' rights. Um, it, it's not the workers' fault that their pensions uh, are underfunded today. Uh, that, those were decisions made by legislators to borrow money from pension funds, with supposedly they were supposed to pay them back, and they weren't paid back in a timely way. And now those pension funds are, are underfunded. So I do think we need to be serious about um, coming up with a plan for adding revenues to uh, the pension funds directly above the minimum statutorily required payments. Uh, but that's a difficult conversation to have when you don't have enough money coming into the state on a day-to-day -day basis to deal with just regular um, core obligations like education or um, you know, healthcare or the pensions, which, you know, the, the longer we wait to put money above and beyond the minimum statutory requirements, the worse that underfunding is going to get. So it's just a difficult conversation that can be more uh, realistic in nature. Okay, uh, here's a question about technology. Are there potential opportunities for innovation that you want to explore or have there been new improvements to aid in public transparency? I think we kind of outlined that from the beginning, but go right ahead, Susie. Yeah, well, that's my big next project, right? I think that the first thing that I had to do was get the uh, bill backlog under control, which we've clearly, clearly done. Um, and I think, well, now I think I know for sure that my next big initiative, right, Karen, you touched on the fact that as city clerk, I modernized the city clerk's office where now instead of people waiting three to four hours in line to buy a city sticker, they at most in person, you're going to have a five to 10 minute wait and people can buy their sticker for a one year or a two year online in their pajamas or in the buff, right? Whatever. <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah. I've got some experience modernizing archaic systems. And what we're doing now is we're going to do the same thing in the state of Illinois controller's office when it comes to our IT systems. We're definitely investing more strongly in our systems. We all saw, you know, what happened with um, the Illinois Department of Employment Security last year when their outdated systems just couldn't keep up, right, with the unprecedented numbers of these unemployment claims coming in during the pandemic. And I, I know that the governor is doing everything he can to try to work with an archaic system that he inherited. Um, but I really personally believe that we have to be proactive when it comes to modernizing our end of life IT systems on our terms, right? Not when something catastrophic happens. So we recently 
kicked off an exciting project to modernize our IT infrastructure, especially the systems that help us carry out the core responsibilities of our office. Obviously, things like you know issuing paychecks or processing state vouchers and recording contracts. But this will make us much more uh, efficient. Um, it's going to create much greater and provide much greater transparency for budget and policymakers, uh, the media, interested citizens. Uh, it's been a priority of mine since taking office. And at the end of the day, Karen, you know, my vision for the Illinois Office of Controller is to make it the most trusted user friendly source of government financial data in the country, one that could provide predictive modeling, data analytics, ROI models. Uh, obviously greater transparency, which of course leads to much more accountability. And I wanna set the tone as controller for in influencing the discussions uh, on state policy and budget in a way that really respects taxpayers. So we expect to have this project, um, it's, it's being built out as we speak and within 18 months should be our, our go live date. And essentially we're just modernizing. My office can see where every single dollar goes because I pay every single bill for the state of Illinois. Yet I can't, under our current mainframe system, tell the story as to what's the best use of those dollars or sure. what the ROI on those dollars are. And we're building a system today that hopefully in the near future will be able to help tell those stories in a better way. Last question for you, and thank you for, for sharing this time. I know you're busy because you're all over the place. And, and boy, I'm glad you're, you're the person holding the purse strings and the pocketbook for all of us Illinoisans. Um, when do you anticipate the end of the multi-billion dollar accumulated debt? So you mean the, the bill backlog? Is that? Yes, yes. So, so we're already within like a week of paying our bills. So I'm going to stop calling it, I think, in the very near future, a bill backlog, because it's more like a payment cycle now. Uh, when I first took office, it very much was a bill backlog. Vendors hadn't been paid for two years in some cases. Right now, I don't owe anyone money that's waiting to get paid by the controller's office. So really, um, the question here is, we should start calling it, or the issue here is I think we should start talking about what our average payment cycle is versus what's the actual number. Because that number is just a snapshot in time. And the majority of that $4 billion that I owe is, is interfund government transfers. So like an agency has X amount of dollars that we might have tapped into to borrow them, but they don't need them anytime soon. So it, it allows me to have some cash flow so that I can deal with some of these other more pressing concerns like nursing home or hospice care or other social service providers that need to get their funding right away. And at the end of the day, as long as I'm able to pay the state bill, within, you know, 30 days, we're golden. That's, you know, as good or better than the private sector. And so um, I think in the near future, uh, start hearing me talk less about the bill backlog and more about an average payment cycle, which is how, you know, the business world does it. Sure. And, and then, you know, we, we've got to just make, make sure that we continue to pass balanced budgets because the, the fate of the bill backlog is actually, is, you know, it's it directly tied to whether or not budgets are balanced moving forward. So I, I, I don't know what to say, except thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time out with us today. Thank you so much for your hard work, uh, your continuum of public service uh, from the state to the county, back to the state again. Uh, I'm just proud of you, Susanna, and the, the great you. work that you've done. And I'm looking forward to the future for you. And who knows where that'll be? But um, you're the best. You're the Hi. absolute best. And thank you so much. Mr. President, it's my understanding that the... Um, the uh, is it the uh, president of uh, our our region is going to be on the, on the call today too? No, she she won't be joining us today. But okay, that's fine. That. Okay, she, uh, let we're, me. We're add. the first. We're the first uh, club in the district to be visited by her, so we're grateful uh, that she came to the installation dinner. Oh, okay. All right. I see Amanda's got something here. She's she's asking. I know you've heard about these high property taxes, and I know that. Uh, your office really has no real role in that, but she wants to know if you can offer assistance to villages struggling with financial problems, such as high property taxes. Yeah, the, the issue, we do have a local uh, government division that works very closely with uh, villages and towns across, all the townships across sure. Illinois. Uh, many of them have very small staffs, right? So it's, it's, you know, you have one person who has to do all the financial reporting for your yeah 
your um, your village, and, and that's always a challenge. And so we have people on staff, including outside um, accounting firms that help uh, and auditing firms that help walk people through some of those challenges. Because of course, we want everyone to turn in their reports on time because that's state law and our job is to report on your reports right so um, if people are having issues feel free to reach out to our local government division and ask for help right don't assume you're in on this by yourself if we can't help you we'll tell you but if we can then you know that's what we're here to do and are happy to do it when it comes to property taxes karen you and i both experience this all the time people would always say lower my taxes and we're like we're, we're not the ones that pass property tax increases. But I will say that we do have responsibility in part indirectly because the state of Illinois has never really done a good job of paying its fair share in a K through 12 education. Absolutely. And as long as we're not paying, meeting our obligations as a state, and in large part because we have a massive structural deficit that people want to pretend is not there, but it is. It's not as much as people want to say, it's not as um, revenue, it's, you, it's a spending issue. That's just political talk because the reality of it is we have the least amount of state employees per capita in the country. Actually, I think it's the second uh, worst, right? In other words, we don't have that many employees per uh, Illinois resident. So it's not a staffing issue. We're not like bloated with uh, state employees. Um, and we do have to pay for things like healthcare, police and fire, right? Public safety. Um, we have to pay for sick people in Illinois are never going to make a profit for our state. So we have to recognize that every year there's certain buckets that keep getting more and more and more expensive. And I'd also argue that until we start putting more money towards uh, some of these pension above and beyond the statutory minimum, that number is going to keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse as well, right? So there are decisions that have to be made um, that are not necessarily politically popular, but I think that spending more on education is something that all of us should be able to agree on, that when we do see additional revenues coming in, they should be earmarked in large part for education, because once we can get a handle on that, then your local taxing bodies are not going to need to be picking your pocket every year, or every couple of years asking for more money, which comes of course through higher property taxes. So it is a problem in Illinois, but I think all of us have to get educated on the fact that we don't actually pass property tax increases, but you should be pushing your legislators to figure out how to put more money into A through 12 education, because that's the number one source of why you see property tax increases across our state. Yeah, I think that uh, if uh, people would really uh, analyze their tax bill and they see these um, uh, amounts that are, you know, being uh, uh, charged to them, they'll see number one on that list certainly is education, um, uh, whether it's your high schools or your colleges, community colleges, um, your local um, share and it tells a story and certainly every every year you know uh they have to file a levy and the uh, villages and they file a levy and sometimes they'll increase their levy other times they they won't but they're not they're it's it's education and i think you're you're on to something there we really need to force the state to pay its fair share as it relates to education because that's what they're supposed to do but that's another fight right <laughs> yeah and you know there's one other thing i do want to add to that that of course would have been possible had that fair tax amendment passed oh, right but i think people yeah. just you know i think they didn't they didn't necessarily i don't want to say people are uninformed right but let's just say people believed a lot of false messaging out there and they thought that they were voting to protect their own interests when in fact they were hurting their own interests and you know tying themselves to higher property taxes down the road because we're not able to put more money into things like higher education or stabilizing pension debts, right? So um, we do have every year about a three and a half to $4 billion structural deficit. That means not enough money to pay for just the core obligations like uh, public safety, education, um, you know, uh, health care services, social services and human services. These, these are important buckets, right? So we're not out there like buying yachts with money that doesn't exist. It's just, I think people have that perception because they don't trust government. And as controller, that's one of the reasons why I focus so much on these transparency initiatives, because we want to be able to tell the story of how taxpayer dollars are being spent and what the needs are so that someday when people do say we need more revenues, we can prove why that is the case instead of just say it because that tax got defeated, I think more because people don't trust government 
than because they didn't understand what it was going to do, you know, but, um, you know, we need to restore trust in government. And how do you do that? By being very transparent. It's not my money. It's the people's money. That's right. And it's my job to try to convince people along the way that they don't want to believe me. They should believe the math. And the math is the math. We don't have enough money coming in, given the expenditures that we have to put out. And that's why we're always going to be running these uh, deficits until we're able to stabilize that component of the of the budget. And lastly, because we've gotten down to almost like a $3 billion mark on our bill backlog, essentially, if we're going to stop calling it that, um, I have introduced legislation through Representative Mike Halpin out in um, the Quad Cities. It's House Bill 4118, so take a look at it. And it would, it would create an automatic trigger of $200 million into the Budget Stabilization Fund, which is our rainy day fund. Uh, by statute, so that when we've met certain markers, right, that we're in good shape, we're paying our bills within 30 days, we've hit this X amount of dollars on the backlog, then um, you'd see a $200 million deposit into the rainy day fund each year that we meet those markers. And that is huge because Illinois, during the pandemic, we, we didn't have enough money for 30 seconds worth of government operations in our rainy day fund. When most states, you know, have four to 10% in their rainy day or stabilization fund. So we had squat, we had nothing. And we were totally dependent on the federal government hopefully helping us through COVID, which thankfully we were able to leverage that as best as possible and in the smartest way. But it is time more than overdue to start like you would at home, right? You start digging yourself out of debt and then you start becoming more fiscally aware and responsible and you set up your emergency fund and you don't just set it up, you actually start putting money away. And that's what we need to do in, in Illinois. So we are now officially going to start putting money once we meet these markers and the law passes automatically into the rainy day fund at a much larger amount. We have like 9 million in there now. We had 60,000 in there before. So we're putting more away now, but uh, it's still like pennies compared to what we need. But if we could go from 9 million to 200 million and then another 200 million and like that, you know, you see it growing right before your eyes and Illinois will be in better shape. And the credit rating agencies will hopefully respond accordingly. Comptroller Susanna Mendoza, it's been our pleasure to have you with us today. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I look forward to hearing more and more about all the great things that you're doing for us at the state level. And you've got all kinds of other things that you do um, in community as well. We didn't even get to that. But Mr. President, that ends our programming for today. Unless there's someone who has a, a another question. I don't see any other questions in the chat. So um, I'm going to throw the mic to you. Thank you, Susanna. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Susanna, what a, Susanna, what a wonderful presentation. We really appreciated <laughs> Uh, hearing from you today and boy your brain is working fast oh thank you i can go on for hours with nerd speak yes no worries i'll but say I'll... I'll say amen to that <laughs> um just a reminder to everyone mark your calendars for next saturday morning september 11th at 8 a.m if you have to come later you have to leave early we still would appreciate any effort you're able to make to help us to make our community more attractive uh, particularly those folks traveling through on the train, but also our residents at the uh, intersection of Fifth and Lake. Again, meeting though at the Maywood Public Library uh, next to the Rotary uh, Memorial. There's a, a very shiny uh, chrome colored sculpture and um, a sitting area surrounded by a, a circle of bricks that you will recognize as, if you read the plaque there is a donation from our club to the village of Maywood. September 11th, a week from Saturday, 8 a.m. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, Mr. President, one more thing. Um, so our, our evening meetings, I didn't understand that I was also supposed to provide um, programming. So I have um, Armanda Killingham shared something with me um, earlier about someone that, I, and I think it has a lot of great merit um, Armanda, are you on? Are you still here with us? Let me see. Well, I'd like yes, to correct that. You don't. You aren't asked to provide programming for that because oh. the uh, October, excuse me, September and October meetings will be dealing with bylaws and policies and procedures. Oh, okay. Well, I want to get in. I, I, I do want 
what she shared with me, I think it has real merit. So I'm going to have to plug it in somewhere. And the other one is Rebecca Wall. I really want to hear from her as well. So I have two. I got to find somewhere to put them so that we can hear from them. Okay. Thank okay. you. Sure. Clark, that sounds um, good. Karen, just, to, just, yeah, that's me. Just to um, give you an update, the gentleman I spoke with, um, he, I forget his name, which is terrible. Um, but um, he's on the DE and I, he's the president of the, I think the international club or something yeah, yeah. out of San Francisco. And he is also on the DE and I team. Um, I think on the international level as well. Um, I know it's terrible. I can't remember. I got so many things. That's in my okay. Head. That's okay. He, he travels a lot. And so he told me he wouldn't be available anyway until um, October, like an October okay. um, evening meeting. So um, because he travels and he was saying that with the time, um, you know, change and stuff. Sure. So, yeah. So, he Amanda, was, I tell you what, why don't you circle back with me and, and you and I okay. will work on that together because I do want to get him scheduled and even if I have to move somebody around, I'd like to get him scheduled. I think that has a lot of merit for our club. And I'm looking yeah. forward to hearing from him. And the same thing with uh, Gary. If you tell Rebecca, I did not forget about her, that <laughs> I absolutely plan to reach out to her and include her in our programming. Okay. And just in the okay. DEI area, too, I might uh, interject that we've been promoting a DEI series on Thursday nights. Um, not every Thursday, but there's a certain schedule. District-sponsored DEI uh, training experts and a number of our club members are already participating. I think the next one is um, tonight. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll resend uh, the uh, Zoom links and so forth. Uh, they had asked for people to register, but I think um, it's easy to attend. And uh, for those of you that are interested in this area, and it is critical I think for all citizens of our country, um, even the trainers <laughs> need to revisit their training. So uh, uh, for that unconscious bias that we might all suffer from. Uh, thank you again for today. I'll send that information out to you right away. And uh, everyone have a wonderful Labor Day weekend. This meeting is adjourned at 1.18 p.m.